Hello, I'm David Spangler, and this is Focus on Creativity, an ongoing series on the arts created by Nova Southeastern University's Museum of Art, Fort Lauderdale. In this series, we bring you artists, scholars, art historians, curators, critics, collectors, and arts experts from around the world to enlighten you on the meaning and value of art in modern American society. Why are creativity and innovation vitally important to a culture's health and sustainability? These are the questions we examine as we pick the minds of these leaders in the arts. Recent research overwhelmingly supports the arts as a source of educational advancement, therapeutic effectiveness, and community building. This series spotlights connections between the sciences and the arts, the left brain and the right brain, and the head and the heart. These interviews with world-renowned artist scholars shed light on the emerging fields of creative process and contemplative studies, and point the way toward transdisciplinary solutions to modern-day challenges. With innovation as one of the core values at this university, Nova Southeastern University's Museum of Art, Fort Lauderdale, welcomes you to focus on creativity. I just wanted to ask Eric about this wonderful Warhol painting of Ted Kennedy. I, uh, I never knew Andy Warhol to be a particular political mm. figure, so how did this happen? Well, it was a commission from the Kennedy campaign, and it was for a fundraiser to raise money for him as he was running for Senate. And obviously, if you take a power figure from a power family like the Kennedys, and you mix Andy Warhol into it, and you make it a very pop, American image, one would think that it would work really well as a political gesture. Now, in terms of Warhol's own politics, he definitely leaned into the Democratic liberal side, although he was very fiscally conservative in a lot of ways. But um, this is not the only political campaign poster image that he did. He also was commissioned by George McGovern to do a campaign poster um, that would be used um, to get people to vote for George McGovern. And normally you would think, like this one, he would take George and do a portrait of him, but he did, did the exact opposite. He chose to depict Richard Nixon, who McGovern was running against, and he took Nixon's image and painted him goblin green and said, vote McGovern. <laughs> so it was a joke. And sadly for Andy, Nixon won the campaign. Right. And starting that year, Warhol was audited by the IRS every single year until his death. <laughs> Things can backfire. Things can backfire. One needs to be a little bit careful. But this one is, um, I mean, it just screams America and an apple pie. And it's amazing. With the diamond it. dust, it's just pop. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Our museum has the good fortune to have this entire uh, Andy Warhol series on Mao. And uh, I love the way it's displayed in our museum. Uh, Eric was talking about that earlier. And I just want you to tell me a little bit more about how this came about and what the purpose uh -huh. of the repetitive pattern. And absolutely, and the series is absolutely phenomenal. We have one full set at the Warhol Museum as well. And when I came here for the opening of the Warhol and Car Show, I rounded the corner and saw them here right. against this black wall, and it's so chic and gorgeous. And um, you know, this is Warhol at his finest. The color palette is beautiful. There's a little bit of handwork done um, on the original paintings, which translate over to the prints. Um, and Obviously, you see one of the leaders of the world, um, Chairman Mao, who is front page news in the early 1970s because of Richard Nixon and trying to open up China um, for trade. And Warhol notices this, and Warhol likes powerful people. So he likes celebrities, he likes people that are in the news. Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor, you name it. Um, Jackie Kennedy. So it makes sense for him to want to depict Mao at that very specific moment okay. where Mao's on the cover. So he literally goes and finds a, a Mao's little red book and uses the photograph, the image of Mao on the cover as his source material, blows it up, and um, this is, of course, the full set of works on paper, but there are also tons of paintings on canvas, and some of them are as tall as 16 feet. Um, there's a great one at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and standing in front of it, it just overpowers you, and you get that pure, the pure idea of power that Mao okay. once had. It's phenomenal. 
Another wonderful surprise about Warhol to me was that he did a series on uh, you know, uh, endangered species. So we have a wonderful example of that here, and I want Eric to tell us a little bit about this particular uh, painting and the whole series. It is a really great series, and it's called Endangered um, Species, and Warhol did it as a fundraiser for the World Wildlife Fund. And there's a panda bear, there's a tree fo frog, there are all sorts of animals that in um, the 80s were labeled as perhaps um, in danger of becoming extinct. And the, the rhinoceros here is really fantastic, and the orange background on this one, and each one in the series has um, different color arrangements. This one in particular is so nice in that you've got that great orange ground and the blues and all of that really lovely line work in red. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would be fairly hard to make a rhinoceros look sexy, but he succeeded. He did it. He did it. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, good. The thrilling thing about these two early Andy Warhols is looking at his, the origins of his, of his talent and his skills. And these are not normally something that you would associate with being done by Andy Warhol if you just saw them without the name. So I wanted yeah, Eric to kind of fill us in on this early, early period of Andy. Well, these two drawings are really stunning. And they're from 1946. They were made the summer after his freshman year at Carnegie Tech. And they have a very interesting story behind them in that one would think that the artist who would go on to become one of the most famous entities in the world, not just in the art world, but in the world right. in general, would have been a star student um, from day one. Actually, Warhol was threatened with expulsion after his freshman year at Carnegie Tech because his professors really didn't like his drawing style. So they basically gave him an assignment over the summer that was a life drawing class, and he had to go out into the streets and observe and draw what he saw. Um, luckily for Andy, his brother Paul provided very good subject matter in that he sold fruits and vegetables from the back of a truck driving through Oakland, the family's neighborhood, and Andy went with him and would sit off to the side and sketch what he saw. Um, they're incredibly um, technically beautiful works. They certainly do not look like the hand of an 18-year-old, um, but um, they're not classic Warhol style, and the reason is because Andy um, realizes that if the professors don't like his style, he needs to succeed, he needs to stay in school. So what he does, he completely mimics his professor's style, okay. takes them back at the end of the summer, <laughs> presents them, and of course, they say, wow. Right. So I, I, I have had trouble getting, as I show people through the museum and I come to this mm. ex exhibit here, I have trouble getting the grown men out of the room because yep. they're throwing the balloons around and... Um, Absolutely, people just engage with it so much. Um, we do visitor surveys at our museum and this hits number one all the time yeah. for the best um, experience that people have had at our museum. Um, when I was an intern at the Warhol Museum when we opened in 1994, one of my duties was to fill the silver clouds with air and helium um, to get a perfect balance and I would love to just lay on the floor before <laughs> the museum opened and watch them drift overhead. It's a really right, fantastic that's, experience. That's what Andy wanted you to do. Absolutely. <laughs> and there was a story about him actually taking the mylar, the silver mylar, mm -hmm. and hot gluing it and actually coming up with the prototype. With the idea of the prototype. Yeah. Um, but of course, mylar balloons were nothing new per se. Um, they weren't as widespread as they are today with, you know, every right, um, birthday, and, birthday and, anniversary. and anniversary event. But um, definitely he would work on prototypes for all sorts of things. And then, as always, he would find a, produ a production company that could make it um, and do it as a um, almost what you would call a production line um, product. So it just plugs right into the idea of the factory, right. um, the assembly line, and we still use um, We've used the same company to make them since the museum has been open. Wow. All right. Um, we have here the, uh, the trucks. And this is another unusual thing. If you say Andy Warhol painted trucks, people will go, oh, really? Mm -hmm. And so Eric's going to fill us in now about Andy's trucks. It is amazing. But whenever someone says, did Warhol do this? Did Warhol do that? Did Warhol do an asparagus? I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. We'll just find it. Because he basically <laughs> painted or drew or depicted or photographed anything known to mankind, which makes it pretty easy for us to link 
him to any trend that someone wants to discuss, but I get that reaction as well when I say, oh, have you ever seen the trucks? People say, trucks? Who would paint a truck? Well, Warhol did, and he did it really well. The color arrangement on these prints is absolutely stunning and um, really pure 1980s. These were made in 1985, and this color palette couldn't be more 1980s. And we just discovered a few weeks ago the source photograph um, that was used to make these. I'd always thought that it was just your standard American semi-truck, not really thinking about the scale and the size of the truck. Well, when I found the source image, it is actually um, a German truck. It's a Mercedes-Benz. Really? Yeah, and the back part is probably about um, only two-thirds the size of an American semi-truck. And we'd never seen that image before. It was actually in a stack of papers that one of his former assistants had um, when Warhol um, died, he just never returned that stack of papers, and uh, that's where that image was. Wow. So that'll be coming to the museum. We're really excited. And, and what is the significance of the recurring image? Well, Warhol loved the idea of repetition and multiplication, and there are a number of reasons why he does it. One would be to think about going into a grocery store, and you're standing in front of an aisle with cereal boxes or soup cans or whatever it is, and they're there in bulk. There's lots for the taking, and you take what you want, you buy them and take them away. So there's definitely that commercial sales angle in presenting it and um, making the consumer want to buy. But there's also, um, I, I think, something that Warhol once said is very indicative of why he does this. Um, in painting celebrities, Marilyn Monroe or Elizabeth Taylor, and he does them in multiple forms as well, um, he said that when we go to the movie, we only want to see the star. I mean, we want to see as much star as we can get. So we're not so much interested in the storyline or the landscape or the backgrounds. We want to see Elizabeth Taylor or Marilyn Monroe. So he said, in doing my paintings, I'm giving you as much star as I can by that repeated face again and again and again. And the same with any other image that he repeats um, ad infinitum, that he's giving you what you want and that's bulk, and that's a lot, and it's big, and that's what he was thinking. As I come to the museum every day and I look at these again and again, it also, it seems to make me look at the basic image in a different way because of the different color treatment. For yeah. some reason, it brings out different features in oh, the image. Oh, absolutely, and that's where, you know, from an art historical perspective, a formal art historical perspective, to see what color does when juxtaposed with another color, it is a totally different image and a different experience. And luckily to see them all together, you really um, see that in right. that if it was just a one-off print, you might not think so much about what it would look like in another arrangement. And Warhol was constantly shifting his color arrangements in the print series. Um, many of them are unique um, and only exist in that one image. And another one will be a completely different color palette. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you.